Good morning. Welcome to worship today at St. John's. Today we're continuing our summer sermon series. So to kind of give us a recap, put us where we've been at. So we're going through the whole Bible uh, in 12 weeks. So there's a lot of different Bible stories you could talk about. So we started with creation, God's perfect creation, where everything was just right, but we all know that that didn't stay that way. So then we had the fall into sin. Then we had the promises God gave to Abraham, saying your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And then we continued through seeing what happened to God's people when they went to Egypt. They were stuck in slavery. God brought them out of Egypt, the Exodus. And now this week, God's people have a need. They want a leader. They want someone to guide them. Even though they've had that the whole time, they've had God, they need some earthly help. So this week we talk about the kings and what happens by asking for that earthly help, that different type of leadership. So that's kind of where we are leading this week. We have two more weeks in the Old Testament, then we get to celebrate Christmas in the middle of July as we get to talk about Jesus' birth and we go into the New Testament and those six stories. So thank you once again for joining us this week. We'll start by sharing the peace of the Lord with one another. You can do that by shaking hands, by clapping, by giving high fives, hugs, whatever you are comfortable with, then we'll sing our opening hymn. him. make our beginnings today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the call to worship based on Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. 
Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. Now we go to God confessing our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In our scripture today, we're going to see how God's people basically chose someone else over God. They wanted an earthly leader. They rejected God. All of us are guilty of that. We do that. We are sinful. We put other things, other people before God. And yet God says, after all that, I love you. That's why Jesus came to this earth to die and rise again on the cross to take away all of our sins. That's what kind of leader, that's what kind of love God had for us. So hear that reminder this morning. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. May please be seated now for our hymn of praise, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. reading, the elders of Israel approach the prophet Samuel to request a king, even though God is their king. 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 9. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. 
So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they are rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. This is the word of the Lord. In the second reading, David asked permission to build a house for God, a temple. God responds by saying that he will build a house for David, not a building, but a dynasty. From this lineage will come the Messiah. 2 Samuel 7, verses 11b through 16. The Lord declares to you, that is David, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, if any of the kids would like to come forward for a children's message. Good morning, boys. Good morning. Good morning, girls. Good morning. So this morning, I was hoping you guys could help me figure out what a word means. You think you can help me with that? Okay, so if I say the word leader, what does the word leader mean? Or who are some people who are leaders? What does the word leader mean? Yeah, Avery. Yeah, you lead things, exactly. See, leader's kind of one of those funny words because we could say, well, it's people who lead, right? But we need to know what it means to lead. Now, some of the people who are leaders, that might help us. So who are some people who are leaders in your life? Who's a leader? The president. Yeah, he's the leader of our country. What about our house? Who's in charge? Who's the leader of our house? Mom, ooh, that was a good answer. Mom and dad. <laughs> good one, yes. Uh, what about the church? Now, I'm here this Sunday. Am I usually in charge? Who's really in charge of the church? This is a tough one. Who's really, exactly, Jesus is really in charge of the church. So, yeah, leaders are people who help us. They make decisions, and, and some of the decisions are good. Maybe some aren't, but they help lead us. They help make big choices. So, I have another question today. Do you guys, do you guys want to play a game? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. I was hoping you would say that. So, there's a game called Follow the Leader. Do you guys think I'm a good leader? You guys, yeah, oh, I, I, like I like your excitement. Okay, so follow the leaders of the symbol game, so stand on up. So here's the deal. There's a place you never get to go in church, okay? You probably see me go back there and disappear. You have no idea what's back. Do you guys want to find out what's back there? Okay, we're going to follow the, follow the leader game, so let's make a line. Let's make a line. Avery, you're going to be in front, okay? All right, I got my Nora. You're going to be my caboose, okay? Hey, come on, right, right, right. oh, yep, yeah, right, right, right. Right there. Okay. Okay. So follow the leaders. Then you got to follow me. Let's go this way. Come on. Back into this room. See, they can still hear me in here. 
See, we got a lot of stuff in here. It's really not that exciting. Oh, see, we can go up here. Ooh, and people never say I go up here. So let's go up. I I'm going to go up here. Oh, oh, come on all the way up. Come all the way up. Okay, now we're in. Oh, come on up. Yep, this is the leader. This is where I'm going. We're all the way up here. Look how, whoa, look how small those people look down there. Whoa, how about that? Should I ever give a message from here? Should I preach from here sometime? Maybe. We'll see it happens. Okay, everyone's up here. Okay, we got our caboose. Okay, now let's work down here. We're going to follow the leader this way. Now, ooh, Nora's our leader now. Oh, where's Nora? Oh, we're going that way. Nora's going this way. Okay, let's go, let's go. Follow the leader, follow the leader. Oh, okay, where are you going to take us, Nora? Where should we go? Oh, back. Oh, okay, that was, I was going to go out and get donuts or cookies, but okay. I'm just kidding. All right, let's come back and have a seat. Oh, I know. We'll wait till after church for that. Oh. So, what did you guys have to do? You had to trust me. You didn't know where I was going, did you? Did you think you were going to go back there and up there today? No, that's different, right? So leaders are people we follow or listen to. Now, does every decision mom and dad make, the president, uh, the pastor, do we all make every decision right? Every single one? No, not all the time. A lot of our decisions, our parents make lots of great decisions for us. Our presidents make good decisions. But not every decision we make is right. Who's the only one who makes every right decision? Jesus. 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 Exactly. God makes every decision right because God is our main leader. That's why we can always pray to God to ask God, hey God, help us be a good follower of you. Help us to listen to you, read the Bible, listen in church, because we're all going to make mistakes. But that's why Jesus came into this world in the first place, to save us from all of our mistakes. So let's put our hands together and let's pray this morning. And we're going to pray for some of the leaders you guys mentioned. We're going to pray and thank God for our parents, for our president, and we're going to pray for our leaders. So let's put our hands together and pray. Good morning, God. Thank you for the people who are leaders in our life. Thanks for our parents, our presidents, our teachers, our coaches, and all the people who help us. But most of all, thank you for Jesus. In your name, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for coming up today. You guys can head back to your seats. We will continue by singing our sermon hymn.
Let us pray. God, today as we continue our summer sermon series, Long Story Short, help us continue to see, God, where you are at in all these stories as we read about your people who hundreds of years ago said, nope, we want a king. We want an earthly leader. Help us to realize, God, that we continue to do that. We continue to put other people, other leaders, other ideas before you, yet through it all, you continue to guide us. You continue to love us. You continue to lead us. And you continue to forgive us. Help us, God, continue just to remember what you are doing and how you are taking care of all of us in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I just want a good coach. I remember thinking this repeatedly over my many years of playing basketball. Now, growing up, I was blessed with some amazing baseball coaches with some amazing football coaches, but for whatever reason, when it came to basketball, not so much. They were nice enough guys, sure, but none of them also stuck, stuck, along, stuck around for very long. In my four years of playing varsity basketball in high school, we had four different varsity coaches. And each coach seemed to be a little bit worse than the previous one we had. It all came to a head during my senior season. Now, we were never good. We were a horrible basketball program. But that year was worse than even the previous years. See, I was on a team with a couple other seniors, a junior, and then a bunch of sophomores. And this new coach came in, and he wanted to build this program. He wanted to build it from the bottom up, so he kind of pushed all of us to the bench or relegated us when he played the sophomores lots and lots of minutes. Finally, in the middle of the season, our starting point guard, our team captain, quit. He didn't want to be on the team anymore. Even though he was getting playing time, his younger brother was on the team. He decided, I am no longer going to play on the team. He went to our road games, and he sat up on the bleachers. I remember a couple weeks later, we were having a practice, and we got in a fight during practice. Now, I wish I could tell you on this day that your wonderful vicar was not involved in this fight, but it was a whole team activity, and we looked more like a bumbling group of jokers as opposed to basketball players. And we kept losing. Eventually, the captain came back, but that did not solve any of our problems. The losses kept stacking up, and finally, our season and my prestigious high school basketball career came to an end in a gym in Colby, Wisconsin, in the first round of the Wisconsin high school basketball playoffs. To this day, I can't help but keep wondering if only I had a coach. See, all of us have been in life situations where we find leadership to be lacking. Now, maybe with you it's not basketball, but maybe it's a job. Maybe you've come to the realization that you actually know more than your boss. You have seen their incompetence play out over the years, but yet they are still the one in charge. That's a helpless feeling, and what do you do? Do you try to go above them at the risk of your own employment? Do you seek a new job? Do you just grin and bear it and show up every day and get through it? If only you had a good boss. Or, or maybe the leadership that you feel is lacking is at the government level. Years ago, you stood in that ballot box and you cast your ballot for that certain individual in hopes that they were going to make the changes you felt were right. Yet here you are today and maybe you're questioning some of those decisions. Is this person really who is right for our country? Why can't they do more? What happened to all those campaign promises? If only the government had that type of leader you could trust. See, earthly leadership is limited, but God's leadership is not. See, God's people in our reading today also were after better leadership. The leadership they sought was a king. See, what they've had up to this point, they've decided is not good enough anymore. See, in the time following Exodus, after the great leaders of Moses and Joshua have since passed on, God's people are led by judges. Now, judges are not the way we think of them today. Judges back in Bible times would have kind of been these guys that God spoke to that would judge the people of a certain sin, some way that they were going away and not following God. 
Now, if they were a good judge, then the people would repent of their sins, things would go better until that judge then passed away, then they would start their sin again, and this whole cycle continued over and over and over again. And what we get to reading today is we have Samuel. Samuel's the current judge, and everyone considers him to be a good judge. The problem, though, is the next judge then should have been Samuel's sons, and they were not so good. They were dishonest. They took bribes. They could not be trusted as leaders. So having a judge was no longer good enough for God's people. God's people wanted an earthly king. They wanted someone to, on earth to be the one who could judge them and also going forward to fight their battles because that in that time period was one of the main roles of the leader was to basically be the lead general of God's army. So what the people wanted is a replacement for God. Now right away, Samuel and God both know this is a big mistake, a big, a big error. Samuel even gets mad. He prays to God. And the Lord reminds Samuel of something. He says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, just like they've rejected me many times before. However, God is willing to listen to their request. But he wants something, Samuel, he wants Samuel to do something. He wants them to read the warning labels. He wants to warn them what exactly they are getting into if they have an earthly king. So Samuel lays it out for the people. He says, first, you know your sons that you love very much? They're going to they're gonna die in battle for this king. Your daughters are not going to get to decide what they do. They're going to have certain jobs. They're going to have to work hard. They're not going to have the choice, but okay. Oh, and you know all your best crops, all your, your best livestock, all those things are now going to go to the king. He is going to own these things. Then Samuel even takes it a step further. He says, you, if you decide this earthly king, you guys, this whole country is going to be slaves to the king. Well, this context is important to remember because we remember from last week, God's people had been in slavery for Egypt for hundreds of years. Now Samuel's saying, guess what? Now you're going to be a slave to another person here on earth. Finally, Samuel concludes by saying, you know what? If you do this, you're going to regret it. That moment when you cry out for help, I don't know if God's going to answer because you have that earthly king now that's supposed to help you. So Samuel reads this whole warning list, which this reminds me of those commercials for medical things that come on where they're just throwing out all the warning labels and then they throw up that, you might die. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I'm going to take this medication. God's people get all these warning labels. They listen to Samuel and then they say, no, we're good. Give us the king. We're fine. We'll take all those side effects. We want a king. We want to be like those other countries around us. To the north, south, east, west, they have a king. That seems like the way to go. We need that leadership. So then we have the question, who is going to be Israel's first king? In the next chapter of 1 Samuel, we find out who that will be. The story goes like this. A young man is out looking for his father's donkeys. There's three donkeys missing, and he is out searching for them. And he hears that a man of God is in a town ne near, nearby. And he thinks, oh, okay, if this guy is a man of God, hopefully this man of God can tell me where these three donkeys are and I'll be done searching. See, what this man does not know is this man of God is actually Samuel. And the day before, God told Samuel about this man's coming. This man looking for donkeys would be the one Samuel would anoint as the new king of God's people. His name was Saul. Saul would be Israel's first king. Now, a few things about Saul that I find interesting. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of the tribes in all of Israel. Now, Saul's appearance was very kingly. The Bible describes him as he was a whole head taller than anybody else. So he stood out. He was easy to pick and say, ah, that guy has the look of a king. Everyone could see that Saul looked like a king. Unfortunately for God's people, a king needed more than just a kingly appearance because Saul did not bring much else to the table. In his first test of leadership, Saul is given very specific directions. Go destroy the Amalekites, everything, everybody, their livestock, their crops, everything. Take them over. I'm going to help you. I am with you. Saul doesn't listen. He keeps the king. He keeps the choice livestock alive. He disobeys God. Saul, like the people before him, like Israel's elders, miss God's warning. 
Because of this, there's a consequence. Saul will lose his crown. There's no dynasty of Saul. It will end with him. And this cycle of all the earthly kings will continue to play out throughout the Old Testament scriptures. In many cases, the next king will be worse than the one before them. Oh yes, there will be military victories. A temple will eventually be built in Jerusalem. Positive things will happen, but no earthly king is going to fill that leadership void that God's people opened up for themselves. See, God's people falsely thought that an earthly leader would somehow make it easier than following God. But the earthly kings left the people wanting. They couldn't provide what they had hoped because they were all sinful. They were all selfish. They were all flawed leaders. Earthly leadership is limited, but God's leadership is not. See, what God's people really needed was something more. They needed more than what an earthly king could offer. What they really needed was a savior. They needed someone that could truly save them. And through the earthly kings, God would plant that seed. That seed would be grown through Israel's next king after Saul. That king would be David. Now, it'd be easy at this point to take a break and talk all about how amazing David was. We could talk about David and Goliath. We could talk about the Psalms. We could talk about all those cool Bible stories we learned about as kids. But I don't want to focus on that today. Instead, I want to focus on what God is ultimately going to accomplish through David, not because of David. And that's an important difference. Through David, not because of David. This is where our text lands in the gospel today in God's work through 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. So we'll go through this kind of verse by verse if you want to look at it in your bulletin. So we start in verse 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. So God is the one going to do the true building. It's not going to be the earthly kings. Because the kings are all going to have their own ideas. At this time period, what David really wants to do is David wants to build a temple. That's David's big plan. But God is the one who is going to do the work and working his plan through, not because. We continue with verse 12. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will rise up, raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. See, where Saul's kingdom reign and dynasty ended right away, immediately with him, God is going to continue David's royal line even after his death. And God makes this important distinction. Who's going to establish this kingdom? It's not going to be David, but God himself. God's going to establish it, meaning that God is going to also protect it. Verse 13 and 14. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Right here, they're talking about his son. Solomon is going to be the one who actually builds the temple, the temple that David wanted to build. Continue in verse 14. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. So God is distinguishing two important things. He's reacting to what David wants to do. David wants to build the temple. God's saying, no, that is not for you to build. That is what your son Solomon is going to build. Because Solomon is going to be just like David, that he is going to make mistakes. And when he errs, God is going to be with him. And the future kings and the kings after that, because they're all going to be sinful and flawed. But now listen how God finishes in verses 15 and 16. But my love will never be taken from him, as I took it from Saul, who I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Here God makes an unconditional covenant or promise with David. The royal line of David will never be taken away. That house and that kingdom is going to endure. We have to ask, how? Why? How is that going to endure? Because of God. All this is going to happen because of God. Your kingdom will endure forever before me. This is all going to happen in front of God's sight, under his direction, under his care. He is going to do the building, and God is going to do the protecting. And this kingdom is going to be forever different than any king on earth could offer. Because no earthly king will be able to do this. They can't live forever because they're sinful. 
they are going to die. These earthly kings are flawed and selfish. The new king will need to instead be one with God. This king will not just be a king. He will need to be a savior. Earthly leadership is limited, but God's leadership is not. See, the prophet Micah then speaks of this coming king. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient of times. See, this new king, his origin will be as old as you can possibly get. This king was there at the very beginning of the world at its creation. Now, this king, like Saul, is going to be from a small tribe of Judah. This king will also be heavily influenced by donkeys, but the similarities with this king are going to stop there. See, this king is going to come to serve instead of be served. This king would not be born in a palace, but instead in a stable. This king would not hold a royal place on earth, but instead a royal and eternal place in heaven. We know this king to be Jesus. Jesus would enter this world and lead like no other leader had ever led before. Jesus would not rule by brute force or power, but instead by service and sacrifice. Jesus would fight battles, but his enemies wouldn't be the Philistines or the Amalekites, but instead sin, death, and the devil himself. Where the earthly kings fall short, Jesus would not. Why? Because this was the same God who had always been with his people. This was the same God who had rescued and brought his people out of Egypt. This was the same God who said, yes, you can have an earthly king. Even though I know all the bad consequences that are going to come from that, I hear you, I am listening to you, go ahead, replace me. And all of this happened not because of anything the earthly kings did or anything the people accomplished or what anybody did, but instead all about God keeping that promise that he made to David. God's kingdom would continue before him, before God. This is now the same God that we have today. Sometimes we can get confused or misguided and we put too much trust, too much hope in earthly leaders. It's just like Bible times. We'll look back at the stories of like David and we'll say, oh, they, they were a good leader. However, what none of these leaders can do is replace God as leader and king. They can't replace God because they cannot redeem or rescue us the way God did. Yes, some leaders have laid down their lives for our country. But none of their deaths saved us from our sins. None of their sacrifices could lead us to eternal life. That is why God's leadership in our lives is so different. God is the only leader who can claim, I did what was best for you. God didn't do this through a tax break, a stimulus package, or even helping change a law. God did this through sending Jesus to our broken and sinful world. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we only catch a couple glimpses where we can say, oh, there, there he kind of looks like a king. The first is at his birth in the city of Bethlehem, that same city that David was born in and from. Jesus has brought gifts from the different wise men. Among the gifts is gold. Gold is a gift you could say is fitting for a king. The other time in Scripture we see that Jesus as king is, of course, on Palm Sunday, the day we celebrate the week before Easter. On that day, Jesus sends two disciples looking for a donkey. But unlike Saul, they find their donkey just fine. And that is the donkey that Jesus then rides into the city of Jerusalem. As Jesus rises on the hill up to Jerusalem, that city that David long ago had wanted to build a temple in, people began laying down cloaks. And begin shouting, Hosanna, which means, please save us. Now, please save us is something you would only ask from a leader or king you trusted. And a few days later, that is exactly what Jesus would do. He would save the people. He wouldn't do this by overthrowing Rome and conquering the city. Jesus would save his people by sacrificing himself on the cross for their sins. He would win the battle over death and the devil, and he would rise again. And Jesus did all this not for his own honor or his own glory. Jesus did this for the sole reason of saving his rebellious children. 
Those same children who rejected him as their king, as their leader long ago. The same children now who continue to grumble here about better earthly leadership. While we might not blatantly ask God for a new king, we still put too much trust in earthly leadership. Whether it's people or devices, we wait for the next greatest thing that's supposed to save us. We put our trust in the next president the next political movement, even the next coach who might rescue our team from eternal purgatory. We put our hope in people and places that fail. We have to remember, God does not fail. God continues to bring us out of the places that we should not be. God continues to be with us wherever we go, and God keeps building His kingdom to include us. That's why I wanted to use Psalm 46 today and I just wanted to read the end of it once again and I want you to focus on what God does and what we do nations are in an uproar kingdoms fall he lifts his voice the earth melts the Lord Almighty is with us the God of Jacob is our fortress come and see what the Lord has done the desolations he has brought on the earth he makes war cease to the ends of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shield with fire He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. See, this scripture to me says everything we need to know about God and us and the leader we have. God's voice is so powerful, it can make the earth melt. Yet, what's our role? What are we to do according to this scripture? Two words, be still. We can be still because God is the great almighty king and God is still in this world. Our if-onlys relating to leadership do not apply when it comes to God. God rightly holds the crown no matter who may be keeping those leadership seats warm here while we are on earth. That's what God meant when he talked to Samuel, when Israel first asked for a king, and the same is true now. You want earthly leaders? Okay. They might be necessary, but earthly leadership is limited. God's leadership is not. God holds the crown, God is the king, and God's reign is thankfully eternal. Amen. Now we rise. We get to profess our belief in the God who is eternal, who is with us, who is in power in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We profess this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we go to our God in prayer. After each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, your response will be, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty King, we thank you and we honor you and remember on this day just the type of leadership you provided for us. It wasn't just words, it was actual actions. It was a sacrifice on the cross for our sins. It was rising again on the third day to take away the effects of all the sins that had impacted your people ever since creation, God. Help us continue to trust in your leadership. What, what does that mean? That means we continue to pray to you. We continue to remember that you are in control of our lives. We continue, in spite of difficulties or, or bad earthly leadership, God, you remind us that you're guiding us. You are ultimately still in charge of your people, even when we reject you, even when we say we want different leadership or we'd like to be under new management, God, we know that you continue to forgive us and love us. 
So God, help continue to lead each one of us in our daily lives. God, thank you for calling us into your, your love, into a relationship with you. Lord, in your mercy. And God, be with all those right now who are sick and suffering, whether they're hospitalized or uh, recovering from uh, a surgery. God, we know that in those times it can be difficult. We, we can even question, God, where are you? What are you doing? What is happening? Uh, are we being led the way we're supposed to, God? But remind us that you're with us, that you're with each one of these people. Bring them the care and the healing that they need, whether that's physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever type of healing they need, God, please provide that for them. This morning we bring before you Dorothy Bonin, Todd Schultz, Ron Trick, Steve Vogel, LeVon Beyer, Webb Quaddy, Lori Storms, Larry Hoffman, Chad Henke, Dwayne Hoyer, Gary Radke, Lorena Pauley, Bruce Powelk, Cindy Beck, and Randy Feltman. Continue, God, to be with these people, be with their families, and be with their caregivers. Lord, in your mercy, and God, be with us also as we celebrate. We celebrate this last week the birth of Baylor John Becker, born of Logan and Malia uh, on Friday, July 1st. Just continue to be with their family, help strengthen little Baylor, and uh, bring Baylor soon to the waters of baptism. Lord, in your mercy. And God, also be with those who grieve. We know you are close to those who are are hurting and afflicted in heart, God. Today we ask you to be with the family of Carolyn Radicke, the sister of Randy Rogi, who passed away this last Thursday uh, out in Oregon. Please just wrap their family in your love, God. Remind them of the sure and certain hope we have in Jesus as our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. And God, also be with all our youth and chaperones and everyone at the National Youth Gathering right now in Houston, God. Continue to be with those kids, those leaders. Remind them, God, that you are with them. Help this be that amazing experience that helps strengthen their relationship with you, God. Help them see that through service, through worship, through prayer, through all the different things that they get to participate in. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, God, we join together in the perfect prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time I'll invite our usher forward with the offering. Just a reminder for our offering now, we will present them during the worship services. We have two boxes in the back and a box out on the, the pole out there if you'd like to contribute on a weekly basis to support the ministry. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made and done for us, for the sake of the person who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now receive the blessing today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You please be seated for our closing hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. <laughs>